Well, hi there, folks. Hope you're well. Uh, my name is Eddie Ludlow. I'm the founder of the Whiskey Lounge. And I'm here today to talk to you about um, your English whiskey tasting pack, which I hope you have in front of you and uh, ready to go. If not, go find it, press pause and uh, come back. Um, if you don't have one and you'd like to buy one, we still have them available on our website at thewhiskeylounge.com and they contain some very tasty stuff, so it's well worth getting involved. And as this video is here for all time, then uh, there's no reason not to get involved at some point. Anyway, apart from the, uh, the whiskies themselves, which uh, you should have, um, what would be useful for you to have is some kind of tasting vessel. Now, for me, I use, tend to use these Glencairn uh, whiskey nosing glasses. Have to have used them for many, many years. To be honest, I've tried many, many other vessels. And for our purposes, in terms of analyzing uh, flavor and aroma, they are um, a very good standard. Um, and they're very comfortable to hold and also to drink from, which is obviously very important. Um, you can use wine glasses if you don't have um, these tasting glasses. Um, try and get as small a wine glass as possible. Essentially what you want is something that's going to funnel the flavor, the aroma into your nose. Um, when it comes to you know relaxing at home with a dram, I tend to use a heavy tumbler. Uh, I just love the feel of a big tumbler in my hand. And, um, but, for, for tasting purposes, trying to get as much information out of the liquid as possible, they're not the best. Um, so better to go for something that's going to funnel all that loveliness into your, into your nose. Um, then you need certainly some water. Now, again, um, if tap water is all you have, hopefully it's a good quality tap water, then fine. But preferably a spring water rather than a mineral water. Mineral water, as it sounds, contains minerals which can affect the flavor of the whiskey, believe it or not, uh, whereas spring water um, tends to be more inert, so it's more pure, if you like, doesn't contain um, as, as much in the way of minerals, um, and <clears throat> will help to enhance the flavor of the whiskey without affecting it itself. Um, now, I'm just going to open the can of something here. So this is this is something that we use quite a bit here at the Whiskey Lounge. It's called Larkfire. It's, um, it's a Scottish water from, um, from far up north and is, you know, just very, very good for using uh, to add to, to whiskey um, because it is very pure. Um, so we tend to use this or other... Uh, spring waters, Highland Spring is another one you could use, um, which um, which will help to bring out the best in your whiskey. Um, now, we can talk more about uh, water and whiskey a little bit later on. Um, now, just to quickly bring you up to date, if you're not aware of how whiskey is made very, very quickly, obviously you take barley like this. It is uh, harvested from the fields, steeped in water, and then allowed to dry over the course of time, over a week or so, um, allowed to germinate, that is, sorry. And then we dry it using a process, um, a malting process, whereby it's, it's, it's dried using, generally these days, hot air, which, um, uh, which suffices. Um, certainly in Scotland and Ireland, um, the process would have been... Um, driven by peat smoke, so peat fires, which would be much more common than they are these days. Um, peat was a fuel source, is a fuel source, still used to this day, but not in, uh, not as widespread. And the knock-on effect of that would be that the barley would be wrapped in phenols, which would give it a smoky flavor, and eventually would give the whiskey a smoky flavor, a la something like Laphroaig or Ardbeg or something like this. And nowadays, industrial maltings tend to use um, tend to use techniques that produce an unpeated malted barley, unless you specify you want peated barley. Um, and therefore, most single malt whiskies these days are unpeated. Um, then it's ground. It's sent to the distillery in the whole malted barley form, as you saw there, 
ground down in the in the grist mill at the distillery into a sort of rough cereal like almost looks like alpen or something like that it's then uh, flushed with lots of hot water which uh, has a natural reaction with the the grist which is to explode all of the the sugars out of the um, out of the barley grist and create a uh, sugary watery solution called wort uh, this is then um, transformed into beer and to do so you add yeast to this uh, the yeast, your yeast eats away at the sugar creating alcohol heat and co2 um, most distilleries um, ferment for between 48 and 100 hours or so so there's quite a wide variation and this can have quite a bit of impact on the final flavor of the whiskey as we'll uh, maybe touch upon later on now once you get to the uh, to the beer or the wash that you want, normally between seven and nine percent alcohol. Um, you then need to um, distill this. You distill it in generally in copper pot stills. Um, the copper pot stills are essentially giant kettles uh, which act as a um, amplifying vestibule, if you like. So you boil the, the beer from underneath. Um, the alcohol vapors lift off the liquid and are recondensed as they're sent along the um, line arm. And they're recondensed the first time at around 25% alcohol, uh, which obviously is not strong enough to become whiskey yet. So it's, it's um, once it's condensed, it's sent into another set of stills or still, and it is distilled once more uh, up to around 65, 70% alcohol. And at this point, um, the whiskey maker chooses his middle cut, which is essentially the, the purest element of that spirit run. Um, the rest of it is reserved and redistilled for the next batch. Um, but the, the middle cut is uh, extracted and then filled, uh, reduced in to, down to normally down to 63.5% ABV um, before being put into whatever type of cask that uh, manufacturer is going to mature their whiskey in. Um, as a as an example, this is actually new make spirit. So this is 63.5% alcohol, looks to all intents and purposes like water, uh, but don't let that fool you. Um, this bottle is uh, very lethal in the wrong hands. Um, but whiskey before it uh, goes into cask is completely clear. It is the process of maturation in oak casks, which defines whiskey from many other spirits, from, certainly from white spirits. And therefore it is also the process in which whiskey receives its color, as well as the um, well-documented flavors and flavors that we'll talk about during this video. Um, so when you see whiskey, you see the color of whiskey, it isn't a, uh, a whiskey that's just been kind of injected into it, although uh, Spirit Caramel, aka E130, one, sorry, E150, is allowed to be added to whiskies and is added to certain commercial whiskies in order to keep a consistency of color throughout the years and throughout the batches. Anyway, um, we're going to talk about English whiskey today, as we spoke about before. Um, the first uh, of these, I'm just going to grab mine from up here, is this um, White Peak. So this is a very new distillery. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it. Now I've got a little map and some information that I'm going to share with you as we go through. Uh, so here is the um, here is the map, and that just gives you a little bit of an idea of where these distilleries are. Um, now you can see White Peak is you know, almost in the middle of the country um, in Derbyshire near Matlock. And I'm just going to show you a little slide on White Peak. There we go. So as you can see, um, it's a very young distillery, only established in 2016 by Max and Claire Vaughan and then starting distilling in only in April 2018. So the liquid in your bottle uh, that you have there was actually bottled in September this year. Um, 
and you know from from distillate which would have been a little bit later than april 2018 so it's a 24 month aged single malt so it's not it's not officially a whiskey yet because whiskey officially has to be three years old before it can be called whiskey even even in england um but nonetheless it's a very very worthwhile endeavor to taste whiskies that have or or spirit that's destined to become whiskey to to see the evolution if you like of the of the said um, distillery now as you can see the, the building itself is well maybe you can't see but you, you should see it's you know it's quite an industrial looking building that's no that's no mistake it was a former iron forge um i think it's around 140 years old the original building um, so it was an iron forge, then a then a wire works, um, and it's based along the River Trent near Matlock. Um, and as you can see, uh, certainly from on the left hand image, the stills there they're very very traditional shaped uh, copper pot stills, and the type of casks they're tending to use would be STR or shave toasted Richard wine casks, along with more traditional ex bourbon and sherry casks. Um, now I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the STR casks while we while we nose and taste this. So, just perhaps for those of you who are not as experienced as some, um, my advice to you initially is to hold the glass a few inches below your nose. This is so that you're not going to get overwhelmed with the alcohol vapors, which can very quickly overwhelm your senses and um, make it very difficult for you to, to, to nose and taste effectively. Now, as you become more accustomed to it, feel free to bring the glass closer to your nose or vice versa. And see what you get out of that. Now, STR casks, this is a, a relatively recent um, revolution or innovation whatever you like by a chap called dr jim swan who sadly is no longer with us but was was a kind of revolutionary whiskey maker he was a chemist who worked at the scotch whiskey research institute but latterly worked as a consultant all around the world working with distilleries and and um, people who wanted to build distilleries you know, for, for, from as far afield as, as Taiwan. So he worked with Kavalan, uh, with Paul John in India, um, and, but also domestically in Penderen in, in Wales and, um, and a couple of the um, distilleries that we're going to be tasting today. Um, he was very much seen as the godfather, if you like, of modern whiskey making in many ways. And the STR cask was really his invention, um, which essentially was a way of extracting, uh, you know, a, a, a large amount of flavor in a very short amount of time, even in, in cooler climates. So um, essentially you take a red wine cask and you shave the inside of it um, or scrape the inside of it, essentially using a wire brush or uh, similar to strip away the kind of older material on the inside, then toasting it. Um, so that's giving it a, a, a nice kind of uh, toasty layer on the inside, just toasting the, the, the fresh oak that's been exposed. And then recharring that, that layer too. So you're giving it a real kind of uh, flame throwing, if you like. And, and you know, it's the charring, uh, for example, in ex bourbon casks, which really um, helps to um, give the give the cask the chance to really interact with the spirit, um, and certainly if you think about bourbon itself, you know bourbon has these incredible kind of rich, uh, almost nail varnishy, spicy aromas, which which come from the fact they've been matured in, in very heavily charred casks. So it's always going to give quite a large impact to the to the maturation process. And what you tend to find with these STR casks um, is a remarkable amount of um, mature flavors in a very short space of time, as I mentioned before. So this is only 
um, maybe a shade over two years old, this, this particular single malt. And you can already smell the development in flavor, which is really, really gratifying. I smell kind of bananas, vanilla, kind of uh, spicy oak. You just wouldn't guess that that was only two years old. Um, if you if you do, then your palate's better than mine. But I, if I was if I was nosing that blind, I don't think I would get that that was that age. And give it a little taste. I've added a touch of water to this. Um, it should be noted that this is fifty point one percent ABV, so it's 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 pretty strong. It's not the strongest whiskey we've got on um, today, um, but it's strong enough. But also, water will help break down um uh, slightly heavier flavors and also amplify the lighter flavor set so you should definitely experiment with adding water to whiskey if you haven't done before um, don't believe anyone who says you should never add water to whiskey i mean obviously it's down to personal preference um but for me i take every whiskey on its own merits there are some whiskeys sure that i prefer without water because you get that lovely kind of intensity of flavor, which otherwise you might um, you might dissipate by adding water to it. But there are so many whiskeys that I've tasted um, through the years which have been improved by the addition of water, and in some cases uh, improved dramatically. So I, I always like to give them a chance, particularly at this strength. And when you're tasting whiskey, unless you're in a Wild West saloon of, of old and you've got rough as hell uh, moonshine or whatever is at hand, and, and you know all you're drinking for is really just to get the effect of the alcohol, you know, none of these products we're tasting today are cheap by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and therefore, you want to get the most of them. You really want to be able to say, yeah, I've really given that whiskey a good shot. So when you're tasting the whiskey, take a little bit in your mouth and just allow it to coat each part of your tongue and the inside of your mouth. You give it a good five to 10 seconds and then allow it to slip down your throat. And even when you're doing that, note not just the flavor from, from your tongue and olfactory, but the texture as it slips down the back of your throat. You know, does it have an oily texture, a velvety texture, or otherwise? Because all of these things um, make the whiskey experience come to life. You know, for me, I love whiskey because of the wraparound experience of tasting whiskey. Um, obviously, I like to taste whiskey with people, um, which is quite difficult at the moment. But um, when you're, you're technically tasting it, it's best to um, to look at all aspects of it. Okay, right. I'm just going to get you back. Okay, there we are. So, what did you think of the White Peak? Um, I I really I really enjoy it, and I think it's it's you know for the for the age of it, it's incredible. Um, unfortunately, you can't buy it anymore. It's out of stock. They only they only bottled a, a small amount because, as you can imagine. They really want to reserve their stock in order to have um, uh, more aged stock as, as as they go through the years. So it's it's you know it's always interesting to taste it at twenty four months or a year or eighteen months or whatever it is. But the whiskey maker has to be very very careful that they don't use use up too much of that stock for these kinds of things uh, for later down the line. Okay, now we're going to go with for the next. Um, now this is um, this is a local whiskey to us here in York. Um, this is Filey Bay, which is just to the east of us. Um, so um, it's the northeast of the country. Uh, it is very very close to the coastline of North Yorkshire, near an extremely picturesque uh, fishing village called Filey. Um, um, the Spirit of Yorkshire Distillery, as it's called, is actually just just on the cusp of Hunmanby, which is another small town. But Filey is literally a stone's throw 
so can legitimately call themselves Filey Bay. Um, but Filey Bay is the title of their single malt. Um, the Spirit of Yorkshire is the name of the distillery itself. Um, now, the Spirit of Yorkshire distillery has been producing for a little bit longer than um, than um, uh, White Peak. So they started distilling in 2016. Um, so they now have three-year-old um, juice, which is great. Um, and we saw last year the first single malt releases of Filey Bay, which was uh, which was really great to see. Um, and obviously this year, being the way it's been, we've seen further releases, but perhaps uh, they haven't been as widely seen because none of us have been able to to really get to whiskey shows or anything like that. Um, this was a bottling for Yorkshire Day 2020, which unfortunately was cancelled because, um, well, in terms of the festivities for Yorkshire Day because of the pandemic, um, which is a big shame. But um, for Spirit of Yorkshire released the whiskey anyway, which we should all be very happy about. Um, and this is bottled at 55% alcohol and is a vatting of whiskies matured in PX sherry casks. So that's Pedro Jimenez, which is a very sticky sweet style of sherry, um, best poured over vanilla ice cream, but very, very delicious. Um, so PX casked whiskey along with ex bourbon cask whiskey. Ex bourbon being the most common style of cask still to this point. Okay. So I'm just going to bring up the the the, uh, the presentation again, so you can see um, what Filey Bay looks like. There we go. There we go. We can have a little look at that while we're having a nose. So you can see it was established in 2015, but didn't start distilling until 2016. Um, a friend of ours, Joe Clark, is the whiskey director there. He used to work with us here at the Whiskey Lounge. Um, but he went over there just at the end of 2015, I think it was. Um, and, you yeah, know, he's still there very happy. Um, now, they they very much believe in this sort of field-to-bottle um, ethos, if you like. So the, the, the one of the founders, Tom Meller, um, is a, a brewer of note, um, um, owner of the Wold Top Brewery, uh, of which you may have tasted one or two of their beers. If not, I certainly would recommend them. Uh, so he and Tom and David Thompson got together and decided to start this distillery, uh, which is literally a stone's throw from the brewery um, and the surrounding uh, farmland field, fields in which uh, barley is grown. And all of the barley they use is actually grown on their farm um which is quite quite unique in a way and then it's it's sent to bridlington which is a little bit further down the coast to be malted um and as you can see very traditional copper pot stills again these are two of the largest forsyth copper pot stills outside of scotland forsyth is a very significant um, name as they are the premier producers of copper pot stills in Scotland. They, they um, produce stills which end up all over the world. They're the most in-demand stills uh, or still makers, coppersmiths. <clears throat> um, certainly they, they, they were at the point where their waiting list was two and a half, three years, I think it was at some point. So, you know, extremely in demand. Um, and again, you can see the cask types there that mainly ex bourbon, um, but they use a smattering of STR and also various wine and sherry cask. So I mentioned that this is actually a combination of uh, PX and bourbon casks, um, but they also use STR and, and, and various other. Uh, you can still buy casks um, at the distillery, so you can still. Um, I believe, um, buy a, a cask of um, new make, which they'll store for you quite happily, and, and you can then have bottled when 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 you and they feel it's ready to do so. Um, right, I'm just going to go back to this. And so this is bottled at 55%. Now, you can still buy this. This is a, around 65 quid. 
Um, I think you can get it from the Spirit of Yorkshire website or places like the Whiskey Exchange or um, House of Malt. But you certainly can still purchase this, although there were only 1,500 bottles produced, so I can't imagine there's a huge amount of it still left. Let's give this a little nose and a taste. So this is obviously over three years old, so it's going to have a little, it should theoretically have quite a bit more development about it. And certainly on the nose, I get a little bit more... A little bit more in the way of oaky, smoky flavors. I'm going to add a little bit of water to it. Feel free to pause the video at any time if you feel I'm going a little bit fast. Um, I don't want you to feel rushed. Whiskey should whiskey should never feel rushed. Okay, so when I add water to this, uh very dramatic development i find um i find the water has, has started to lift aromas of boiled sweets and citrus from the from the liquid that wasn't there before the liquid previously was very intense like i say a kind of smoky oakiness about it whereas now this is kind of revealed perhaps a little bit more of the new make spirit of, of the distillate character now it's important that um for me anyway i like to be able to taste where the whiskey comes from uh, i.e the distillery it has come from each distillery has its own house style its own distillate character if you like so uh, quite often or you might find that a, a whiskey is so swamped in in oaky flavors that it becomes quite challenging to taste this distillate character and actually adding water to it really helps to just strip it back down to this. Let's have a little taste of this now. Mm. Now, the other important thing for me for whiskey and then identifying good whiskies is that there's a synergy between when you first nose the whiskey to when the whiskey leaves your mouth and goes down your throat. And that is that there should be a consistently consistency. So the whiskey should smell a certain, you know, of itself. And then when you taste it, it joins up with the with the nose so the flavors become more developed but they're of a similar type and then when it finishes you still get some of that really lovely flavor coming through and certainly um the yorkshire day uh, filey bay for me has that has that kind of tick 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 uh, um, going on which is which is very important and bodes really well for the future of the distillery um, and I think we'll find that in most of the, the examples that we're tasting here today. But what do you think of it? I can say this, that, and the other about the whiskey, but ultimately it's up to you what you think of it. And, you know, the reason that we have, you know, all these beautiful whiskies is that everyone likes different things. And, and, and that is the fascinating thing about not just whiskey, but about human life. You know, it's, uh, we, we're all individuals and we all taste and smell and see and think and do things differently. So it's only natural that not everyone will like exactly the same thing. So if a friend says to you, oh, here, try this, you're going to really love this. Unless you have a very similar palate or similar tastes, um, it's unlikely you're going to like it exactly as much as they do so don't don't be concerned if that's the case um right good let's get on to the next whiskey shall we so i'm going to put this back on the shelf oh and i'm going to taste this so this is bimba uh bimba oloroso cask batch two to be exact bottled at 51.7 percent alcohol so you know, there's no letting up on the alcohol levels with these babies, is it? Um, now, Bimba is, um, again, another distillery in England that started distilling in 2016, uh, which meant they had three-year-old liquid from last year. So 
they were actually one of three distilleries i think that came of age last year so that was um uh, bimber itself spirit of yorkshire and the lakes um so let's just pour a wee bit of this now bimber is the first distillery um in london to actually make or bottle whiskey um there have been uh, distilleries before bimber um but they haven't actually bottled whiskey yet um so Bimba have that uh, accolade to their name. And and to be honest, I'm, I'm very pleased for them because they're a really good bunch of guys and they deserve it. You know, they've, they've worked really hard to get where they are. Um, it's a fascinating little distillery. Um, it's in the most unassuming of, of, of places on a sort of back street in North Acton, uh, Northwest London. Um, and you just you wouldn't know it was there. You wouldn't know it was there until the shutters open, and then you're kind of transported into this distilling wonderland um, where whiskey geeks and lovers um, are at work. Essentially, it's almost like a Santa's grotto of a, of a whiskey distillery. Um, tiny, tiny, um, and they use these beautiful direct fired stills, um, which you can see from the front bar. Uh, and the, the diddy diddy stills, you know, they're not they're not of the you know, spirit of Yorkshire mould or, or some of the others here. They're really very small, and therefore production is is very limited. Um, but they're making really interesting stuff. Let me just get the uh, get the little uh, slide up so you can see <coughs> what I'm talking about. There we go. So you see on the left hand side so those are the two stills that i was that i was talking about um <clears throat> absolutely tiny you can see the shutter just to the left to the outside world uh, but they look almost like more like uh, middle eastern um uh, alembic stills or something and on the right hand side you've got a few casks being matured plus the um plus the uh, the washbacks which are unusually made of oak as well you know most most washbacks are made of either stainless steel or um oregon pine um but these are actually made of oak as well ferment essentially fermentation tanks but we call them washbacks now you can see uh there that it was established in 2015 and started distilling in 2016 by darius he's a lovely guy um as i mentioned um and you know it essentially comes from uh, a family of polish moonshiners uh, with bimber actually means moonshine in polish um but a massive whiskey enthusiast who just wanted to make whiskey um and and you know that's that's quite common for a lot of these smaller distilleries um again that traditional method of distillation um now they also utilize barley um malted at the oldest british maltster which is warminster maltings in the southwest of england uh, which actually the cotswolds distillery that we're going to look at a little bit later also use um and they're very proud of this again uh, almost like the spirit of yorkshire it's very much being able the traceability of all of the ingredients uh is very important to them as it's important to us nowadays you know we're, we're we're no longer satisfied with uh, vague terminology and seeing things which perhaps being made in a very mass produced and, and, and non-sympathetic way to the environment and to the local economies and so on. So all of those kinds of things are very important um, in general these days. Um, in terms of their cask selection, they're very much more on the on the traditional side. So using ex bourbon and various wine and sherry casks. So this, um, as it might sound, Oloroso cask number two. <coughs> Oloroso is a, a, a designation of sherry. Um, it can be dry, it can be sweet. Um, it's always tends to be more full bodied and nutty than like a Fino or a Montiado even. Um, but it depends greatly. I mean, to say there's one style of Oloroso sherry would be entirely incorrect. 
Um, but um, this is this is from a Spanish Oloroso butt. So these days you'll find American oak sherry casks and European or Spanish oak sherry casks, and that does make a difference. See, a Spanish oak, European oak tends to have a wider grain. It tends to give off slightly kind of richer, um, spicier notes than than its American equivalent. Uh, um, so it does it does make a difference, as well as what what has inhabited the cask itself. Now this, as I said, bottled at fifty one point seven. I'm going to give this a little taste at, at full strength. It's really earthy, you know, straight off its own. It's got a really kind of farmyardy aroma, which is, which is really nice. Kind of unexpected for a whiskey from London. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. I'm just going to go back to that. So I'm going to just show you how much water I would add to something like this. Literally a few drops. If you've got a pipette, hanging about yeah <laughs> not all of us do um, then you can be a little bit more scientific about it just a few drops to begin with important to note you know once you put the water in you can't extract it so just a few drops to begin with and then if you need to a few drops more and so on uh, to the point where you think you've reached um, your perfection mm. Really lovely, um, very spicy. I mean, even with that water, I'm getting quite a large amount of intense spiciness, which which is really gratifying. It's lovely, particularly when the weather's very cool as it is here in York in December. Um, I'm sure it's similar to where you are, um, but very lovely stuff. But again, what do you think? what's what's been your favorite whiskey so far and and why can you identify you know what 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 of those whiskies you like and why it is that you like it i suspect you'll have one favorite maybe two favorites of the of the six um personally speaking i do like all of them but for different reasons and you know doing what i do i have to be a little bit more um uh, objective about it and and not necessarily um yeah, you know, I might have a personal favourite, but I'm not going to tell you that. Okay. So, we come to the, the whiskey number four of this selection. So, as you can say, this is The English, uh, which is actually the St. George's Distillery um, in Rowdham, uh, Norfolk, which is... You've got to be careful because they weren't the first distillery in England to start making whiskey. Um, that goes to the Hicks and Healy guys. Um, but they were the first purpose-built whiskey distillery in England uh, for over 100 years. So a very, very significant um, and worthwhile project. I'm going to pour myself a wee bit of that. By the way, the Bimba Oloroso number two, just while it, uh, it reminds me, um, is no longer available. So if you like it, hard luck. But you can, um, and I would, uh, join up with the Bimba Club, um, and then you'll get notifications of new bottlings and so on. And I would say for all of these, you know, go and join their, their membership things. It often doesn't cost anything or it costs a small amount. Uh, you're helping support a small business. And you're also doing yourself the favor of getting to know about the new things, you know, when they happen rather than after the date. Anyway, so the English. And this is the gently smoked sherry cask matured um, version of uh, the English. Let me just bring up the um, presentation there. Okay, so there we go. Um, now, as you can see, it was established in 2006, which, um, you know, it's, it's quite, you know, it's 10 years prior to the likes of Bimba and 
um, <clears throat> spirit of Yorkshire. And whilst you know, ten years in the in the scheme of things doesn't sound like an awful lot, um, I can tell you that the guys there, um, you know, the 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 marketplace for whiskey has has shifted massively in in that ten years. Um, you know, these guys trailblazed and, you know, were perhaps, uh, what's the word? I think, I think they had a bit of a hard time initially because people just didn't want anything other than Scotch whiskey. They didn't necessarily understand the concept of English whiskey. Um, so these guys have actually done a lot of the hard work for everyone else that's come after in terms of English whiskey. Um, they've kind of beaten down a lot of the doors that were, you know, very resoundly locked shut, um, and all power to them for that. Um, but they did do start distilling in two thousand and six, um, albeit a, a very lower level. It was just really testing. Um, they didn't really start ramping it up until early two thousand and seven, um, and they are based near Thetford in Norfolk, um, in you know farming country. So James and Andrew Nelstrup, father and son team. Uh, James, um, you know, the, the, well, both generational farmers. So, um, but they wanted he James particularly wanted to do something different, and he wanted to make whiskey in Norfolk that could challenge, um, you know, Scotch whiskies, the best of Scotch whiskies, and so that's what he set about doing, using copper pot stills again. Uh, utilizing barley grown um, locally. Um, Norfolk barley is among the most highly sought after, and certainly uh, distillers in Scotland will use barley from, from Norfolk as well as elsewhere. Um, they also use barley that's been peated and unpeated. In the case of this whiskey, it's slightly peated. And then <laughs> Again, like uh, Bimba, a little bit more traditional in using mainly ex-bourbon, but with uh, various wine and sherry casks. And you can see those lovely traditional copper pot stills there. It's, it's funny, the building itself um, looks more kind of golf club country house to me, but um, inside is, is, a, is a wonderland of, of whiskey making and, and a whiskey shop, cafe and all that kind of um, stuff. Uh, okay, so I've poured myself. Now this is the, I'm going to say the weakest, but the it's the least strong in alcohol. It's 46% alcohol. And this will almost certainly be the oldest whiskey that we're going to taste today, around seven years old. So this has been uh, matured for seven years in sherry casks and then bottled this year. August this year. Again, I'm going to taste it without water to begin with. Mm. Okay. And then I'm going to add a few drops just to get Again, similarly to the Bimber, I guess, real kind of farmyardy uh, nose of it, which I really like. You get some of the phenols. So often with um, a peaty whiskey, you sometimes get a slight minty eucalyptus type characteristic, which I certainly get from that. Mm. I get it even more on the palate. It almost, almost this slight kind of minty freshness, which is quite nice. Mm. But what do you think? Do you like that one? Pretty good. Okay. Let's get the next one down. So with the, the English... Uh, 
St. George's Distillery. Um, you know, the guys there, as as is very common with most startups, you know, they, they don't have distilling experience. So they have to look elsewhere, you know, um, otherwise it's you're just, you know, setting up a distillery and then operating a distillery is not uh, something that comes naturally to most people. So it's something that has to be taught either, um, you know, through university and, and experience or just um, as it was back in the, in, the, in the good old days, just through gritty hard work and experience. Um, and so for the guys at the English Whiskey Company, um, they sought the help of Ian Henderson, who was the um, distillery manager at Lefroy for for many, many years. So he, he came and worked with them for the first few months um, to really help them understand how distilling worked. And he kind of handed over the reins to David Fitt. He's a lovely guy. He's still there and he's the head distiller, but he came from Green King uh, Brewers. Uh, so he had a very good um, brewing background. Um, but he had to quickly learn, you know, the trade from from making beer to making whiskey, which, you know, certainly there's, there's at least half of the process is, is very similar. Um, but then obviously the distilling process itself is is quite um, quite different. Um, so David very quickly uh, evolved from a brewer to a distiller and um, makes some very very good whiskies. Okay, so we're going to move on to the um, to the Cotswolds um, bottling now. So this Cotswolds, this is what you should have in your bottle. So this is Cotswolds sherry cask, uh, which is the first commercially available sherry cask bottled whiskey from the Cotswolds. Most of their whiskies have either been matured in ex-bourbon or STR casks, or certainly the stuff that's been bottled for commercial sale. This you can still buy, actually, as as you can the um, the English whiskey. Um, the English whiskey is around fifty five pounds, I think. Um, the Cotswold Sherry Cask is sixty five pounds. Uh, I think you can only buy that on the Cotswolds uh, website. So if you go to the Cotswolds Distillery website, you can find it there. Um, it's another limited edition, um, nine thousand nine hundred bottles. Um, which sounds like a lot, but to be honest, <clears throat> that's 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 a pretty you know, fair limited edition, and for sixty-five quid you can't really complain. And fifty-seven point four percent ABV, so it's another healthy lick of alcohol in there. The best thing about that, the fact that these are bottled at cask strength, is it it gives you options. It means that you're not having that decision made for you by the distiller, uh, which is quite important. You know, there's quite a lot of us that like to taste the whiskey at full strength um, and then have the option to take it down in strength using water uh, rather than uh, buying whiskey that is already bottled at 40% or 43% or even 46%. Um, and then, you know, you. <laughs> Yes, you can add water to it, but it, it doesn't retain its intensity quite as well, in my experience. Um, whereas, you know, something bottled at this level, um, you can still reduce it, and it will still have a, a, a pretty healthy ABV. But let's uh, let's have a look at this. I'm just going to pop the next slide on so you can see what the Cotswold is all about. There you go. Um, as you as you might gather Cotswolds Distillery is set in very, very picturesque uh, surroundings. It's, it's a very, very well designed building or uh, set of buildings, actually. Um, very sympathetic to the surroundings. And again, dominated by a pair of Forsyth stills. Um, <clears throat> And this um, is another distillery that was touched by Jim Swan. So Jim Swan was quite heavily involved with the Cotswolds in terms of, um, well, from, from every every area of, of the process. Um, so from fermentation, really, 
through distillation and maturation. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the aim of many of these distilleries or for many of these distilleries is to produce drinkable whiskey in, in, a, in a fairly short space of time, because obviously time is money when you're, when you're distilling. And generally it's going the wrong way for, for, for the first few years. So it's very important that you can start clawing a lot of that, you know, some of that money that you've invested heavily um, as quickly as possible. So the way to do that is to make whiskey as quickly as possible. And certainly Jim Swan's expertise was very much in that area. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, aside from the STR casks themselves, So this Cotswolds, so they started distilling in 2014, so a little bit older than the um, Spirit of Yorkshire and Bimber, um, but only only by a couple of years. Um, but you know this this may contain five six year old uh, liquid in it, and you know every year does count, every month counts, every week counts. But what I hope you get from this tasting, um, along with tastings of your own, is that age age is just is just a number. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean when you see on a bottle of Scotch whiskey ten years old. It doesn't mean ten years old good or ten years old bad. It's just a statement of fact. Uh, so you should never attribute too much emphasis of on on the age of the whiskey itself. You know, certainly over the last few years, having tasted uh, more and more young whiskies, uh, it's become very apparent that uh, more and more the age is just a just a statement rather than a statement of quality. But let's have a little look at this. So this has been matured 100% in sherry casks, as I mentioned before. Um, now, sherry casks are, and sherry cask whiskey particularly, are... A bit of a bone of contention for a lot of people. Some people really love it. Some people are not quite as fussed on it. But um, personally speaking, I think uh, I think they can be absolutely delicious at, at their best. Uh, similarly to ex bourbon cask whiskies, but ex bourbon cask whiskies tend to be more consistent, I would say. Uh, whereas ex sherry cask whiskies can be, uh, depending on the distilleries, obviously can be less uh, consistent. But that is a very sweeping generalization, just to just to let you know. But the color, as you can see, is slightly darker than than any of the others. You can probably see that on your on hopefully in your glass. And that's quite consistent with sherry casks. They tend to, particularly when the sherry casks are, are quite fresh, they tend to throw a bit more color uh, into the whiskey. Not literally throw it, obviously. And then when you get your nose in there, what you should find, even versus the English, which ha you know has an element of sherry uh, note to it, I think was slightly offset by the peated. And uh, richness which you would expect from a sherry cast whiskey. Again, I'm going to taste this. So it's 57.4%. We'll taste this at full strength. Mm. Wow. It really is a big spicy mouthful of a whiskey. I'm going to put a bit of water in there because I think I really like it, but I think I'd like to see what else there is in there. Okay, so I'm getting a little bit, a little bit more kind of slightly marmalady citrusy notes of it with a bit of water in it still a lot of that spicy um note remains mm. 
Mm. Mm. I think I think I may prefer it at full strength, um, which is a bit of a problem at fifty seven point four percent. You don't want to be drinking too much um, whiskey at that strength um, too too often, um, but very delicious. Uh, what do you what do you what do you think? At home? Do you think? Do you like that rich, spicy, robust style of um, single malt, or do you prefer at the start of the tasting where we're we're more focusing on bourbon and STR? Again, you know, it's really your palate is different to mine. I can just give you the facts. That's all I can do. You you, you need to decide what to then do with those facts. Okay, so coming towards the end of the taste and can you believe it already um now we're going to finish with um, a bang <laughs> we're going to finish with this is the lakes whiskey makers reserve and this is whiskey makers reserve number three already i remember tasting the first one last year in october and uh, i think they were taken by surprise with how uh, popular it would be I think there were 6,000 bottles in each batch, and they're already on to number three, which I think is nearly sold out already. Um, and number three is, so they use PX sherry casks, Oloroso um, cream sherry, and Fino, I think. Uh, sorry, red wine casks. So the lakes are quite different to the other five distilleries we're looking at here in that they've been quite um, transparent in that they are very much looking at a sherried house style. So whereas the Cotswolds, uh, Spirit of Yorkshire, uh, English whiskey and so on, <clears throat> they would almost certainly say that, that their house style would be mainly using ex-bourbon or STR casks. Um, <clears throat> the lakes are very much more towards the sherry side of things, which is quite unusual. You know, there's not many distilleries that would put that stamp on their on their on their whiskey like that because a sherry casks are much much more expensive than ex bourbon casks, and b as mentioned before, you know they do tend to dominate a lot more than ex bourbon casks, and you know there are people out there that are not as fond of, of whiskies from sherry casks. Um, but anyway, let's have a, have a little try. So this is bottled at 54% ABV. Let me bring up my little slide here. Here we go. Now I've been to most of these distilleries. I'm just trying to think. Um, yeah, I've been to I've, I've been to three three of the. Four, four of the six, um, and you know I'm very much looking forward to going to the other two, um, and I can honestly say that they're all they're all fascinating and they all have fantastic tours, fantastic people working with them uh, and for them, and are so worth going to see, and you know if you're based anywhere near any of them. You should definitely, when obviously when when circumstances allow, just get in touch with them and say, you know, I'd love to come and um, have a tour or, or something like that because they, they they love to see visitors, they love to see people coming to to to, to see what they do, um, and you know the lakes is no different. Like the the visitor center there is 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 pretty well equipped to deal with most visitors. Um, you know, cleverly like many other distilleries, new distilleries, they've they've taken into account the tourist element. So it's not just about the whiskey and, and the gin and vodka that they make there, but it's about attracting visitors both from far you know, you know farther afield, but also local people um, who can come and meet and have coffee or have a light lunch or whatever it might be. Um, so they're very well equipped to take your money. <laughs> Um, which is you know, massively necessary when when you are a young distillery 
and you still don't have a huge amount of product to sell you know, you've got to you've got to really take every opportunity to 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 survive and to 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 evolve and and, and flourish um so the whiskey makers reserve series uh, as i said was introduced last october so a guy called davil gandhi who um i've come to know quite well used to be at mccallan and there's now the whiskey maker at lakes distillery um he has very definite views on how whiskey should be made and the way he makes whiskey the way he um sees it is, is very much a kind of uh, expression of himself if you like so he's quite artistic and quite um, creative so and and therefore um you know he's he's playing with with palettes of color you know he's playing with making whiskey really um which is fantastic to see and therefore each of the batches of the the whiskey makers reserve have been quite different even though they've stuck to this house style the sherry style they've kind of revolved around that, but they've been quite different themselves. Um, so <clears throat> this number three, as I said, and then you've got a combination of uh, Scottish Forsyth stills and then English uh, brewing equipment from, from not too far away, um, which is quite interesting to see as well. But the way they've shoehorned it all into this uh, listed farm building is is fascinating. They've done you know, an incredible job of, of of getting it in there. Okay, so let's see. Again, really rich dark color, which is pretty much what you would expect of something which has been very heavily sherry influenced. I'll give it a nose. You definitely get that kind of rich nuttiness. Mm. Mm. Wow, so it's a, such a kind of unctuous richness. Wow, it's a really, really big, spicy mouthful to finish on, which um, I really like, I have to say, I think. But then I like sherry cask whiskies. I think that they are, how it can be, extremely profound, and certainly um, at the end of the night, they can they can uh, make your make your night. Um, and I think they've done, a, and Davil's done a fantastic job of putting those whiskies together into this bottle. So I'm looking forward to the um, to the next iteration. Um, but what do you think? What's what's uh, what's been your favourite of the of the six whiskies that we've had? Only you can decide. Um, anyway, that is the end of this tasting. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, we do have other tastings available on the website and um, tastings. Uh, that you can follow along on YouTube. Uh, they range from indie, so independent bottlers, uh, Scotch whiskey, um, Asian whiskies, world whiskies. So there's there's quite a few to choose from. Um, but um, I will <coughs> say goodbye to you for now. Thank you for uh, taking part. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, please do follow us on social media. Uh, feel free to send us some feedback as well. Uh, info at thewhiskeylounge.com. Um, we look forward to seeing you, um, hopefully, when we can actually leave the building and the confines of Yorkshire and, and put on whiskey festivals again. Uh, so thanks once again, and see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye.